Very good morning to you, brothers and sisters and young people. How are you today? Thank you for the invitation to come this morning and bring God's word to you again. Unfortunately, it's not face to face, but at least thank God for technology. You can see me even if I can't see you. I understand that from next Sunday, you will start some face-to-face -face meetings again, and I trust everything will go well with that. Today, we come to a pivotal chapter in Mark's Gospel. Up to chapter 8, Jesus kept his identity quiet. But after chapter 8, he openly talked about who he really is. The passage for us today has a question of who really is Jesus? Before we open the Bible, let us come to God and ask for his help for us to understand. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you for the opportunity to come together to hear from your word, even if it is not face to face. As we come to this pivotal chapter in Mark, please help us to understand your message for us. Please take away any distractions, especially as we are at home and not in church. Father, we want to know you better and to love you more each day. Please be with me also that I can explain the text clearly and faithfully for your glory only. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please open your Bibles now at Mark chapter 8. After the feeding of the 4,000, first tense says that Jesus and the disciples arrived by boat to a place called Dalmanutha. On the map you can see it, it's near the town of Magdala on the western shores of Lake Galilee. Immediately they were confronted by the Pharisees who began to question Jesus in verse 11. They asked him for a sign to prove who he really is. Now, Pharisees are the religious leaders. They know the Old Testament very well. They know all the predictions about the coming of the Messiah. And yet, they still don't know or they don't believe who Jesus really is. They want a visible sign that Jesus is the Messiah. But they've already seen many miracles that Jesus has done. What more do they want? They seem to say, do something supernatural for us now, and then we will believe. Have you ever met people like this? They want proof that Jesus is God, or they want proof that, Je that God exists. I have a friend here in Sydney who wants to know who God is. So two years ago, he started going to church, a good evangelical church. He goes to a weekly BSF class. He joins my monthly uh, men's group. He goes to Bible studies. And once a week, he goes to Bible talks at a Bible college. And he reads lots of Christian books. And yet, he still wants proof before committing his life to Jesus. But isn't, once you get given proof, it's no longer faith then, is it? Because Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is being sure of things that we do not see. So in verse 12, Jesus got really frustrated and he sighed deeply. And abruptly in verse 13, they leave the place where they had only just landed. Jesus doesn't want to give them any sign. And in fact, he doesn't, can't be bothered to spend any more time with them. He just left. This is also a warning to us. If we continue resisting Jesus' effort to reach us, there may come a time when he will just leave us. Remember when Jesus faced Pontius Pilate? And Jesus gave up on him. He didn't want to talk to him. So the warning to us today is not to keep rejecting God. Listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. 
Today, is he saying to us something that he wants us to do or to change? Please listen to him. Now, verse 14 to 21 is a discussion in the boat between Jesus and his disciples. They are worried because they didn't bring bread with them. Food seems so important to them. They're like us in Malaysia, where food is, has a high priority. How can you go on a trip without bringing food? Cannot lie. But this worry about lack of food shows that they don't understand who Jesus really is. So Jesus scolds them by reminding them how much food was left over after the feeding of the multitude. And don't forget this happened not once but twice. 5,000 and then 4,000 men plus women and children. So he asked them in verse 17 and 18, Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? In other words, Jesus asked them, are you still blind or something? They've been with Jesus for a long time, maybe two to three years, but they still don't know who Jesus really is. So when the boat arrives at Bethsaida on the eastern side of Lake Galilee, they meet a blind man in verse 22 to 26. Now, this incident is only recorded in Mark's Gospel. Mark got his information from Peter, remember? And Bethsaida was Peter's hometown. So that may be the reason why Peter remembers this incident very well. Who knows? Maybe he knows the blind man. Because Bethsaida is a small place. It is called a village in verse 23 and 26. We see that Jesus loves the blind man. He takes him by the hand and walks him outside. And twice he put his hand on him. Now the human touch is important for blind people. This is the only occasion where Jesus took two goes to heal a person. We don't know why, but at least it shows that Jesus did not give up until the blind man was completely healed and see clearly. How wonderful. Jesus tells him to go home rather than go to the village. Maybe at home he has a wife and kids who would be ecstatic to see their husband and father come back totally cured and healed. How wonderful. The blind man himself must have been ecstatic. But who does he think Jesus is? We're not told, so we don't know what he really thought about Jesus. Verse 27 then said that the disciples and Jesus went on to leave Bethsaida and go to Caesarea Philippi. This is further north into Gentile territory. That used to be part of Syria, but nowadays it is part of Israeli-occupied Golan Heights. As they were walking, Jesus asked them, Who do people say I am? What he means is, Look, you talk to a lot of people. Give me some feedback. What do people think about me? Who do they think I am? So verse 28 records the disciples' reply. John the Baptist, Elijah, or one of the prophets. When you think about it, these are interesting replies. One group of people think that Jesus is the incarnation of John the Baptist. But that's really a silly answer. Because at one point, Jesus and John the Baptist were together. John the Baptist baptized Jesus. So how could he be the incarnation of John the Baptist? Another group thinks that Jesus was the reincarnation of Elijah. Now, of course, they had not met Elijah himself because Elijah lived about 800 years before this. But Elijah was known 
for fearlessly confronting 400 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. He was known to be a fierce prophet. So they may remember that because Elijah was a major prophet in the Old Testament. Another group of people thought that Jesus is an incarnation of another prophet without really specifying anyone in particular. They obviously feel Jesus is more than just a teacher or a rabbi. So maybe a prophet? But do you notice that they all look back in history? They all thought he was an incarnation of a past prophet. Nobody said that Jesus is a new prophet. The reason for that is that none of the Old Testament books predicts the coming of a new prophet, a messenger of God, except the Messiah. But that's different. The Messiah was to be a king coming from the line of David, that great old warrior king. David was fantastic. He was a warrior. He defeated Goliath when he was only a teenager. And after that, he led his army in battle. David wielded a sword riding a horse. He actually went to life and death battles. Therefore, Jesus could not possibly be the Messiah. They had never seen Jesus hold a sword. Can you imagine this guy wielding a sword, riding a stallion? Can you imagine the king of the Jews defeating the might of the Roman army and liberating Israel? <sighs> not this man. He may be an incarnation of a past prophet, but he's definitely not the future Messiah. As the disciples were thinking these thoughts, Jesus asked them another question. But what about you? Who do you think I am? The disciples must have thought, ah, no. Why do you always ask difficult questions, Jesus? I'm confused. I don't know who you are. I know you're not the Messiah because I just can't see how a person like you can overthrow the mighty Roman army. But I can also see that you are more than ordinary rabbi because you teach with authority and you can debate the teachers of the law and win every time. I can also see that you have supernatural powers because the sea and the wind, they obey you. And although I have never studied physics, I know that law of gravity doesn't apply to you. You can walk on water. So I'm confused. I don't know who you really are. And then they hear this impetuous, brash, silly, unthinking Peter say, You are the Christ, the Messiah. What? Peter, you must be joking. In Mark's gospel, Peter is the first human being who called Jesus the Messiah. Earlier on, at Jesus' baptism, God acknowledged that Jesus is his son. Then on several occasions, demons have acknowledged that Jesus is the son of God, or words to that effect. But Peter is the first human being in Mark's gospel who acknowledged that he is the Messiah, God's chosen one. And so the disciples fully expected Jesus to respond something like this. Oh, no, Peter, thanks for the great compliment, but you are too kind. But no, 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 I'm not the Messiah. But then, they get a second surprise. That's nothing like what Jesus said to them. In fact, Jesus' reply was, don't tell anyone about me. Verse 30. Surprise! Jesus does not deny he is the Messiah. In 
the fact that he says not to tell anyone means that he confirms he is the Messiah. And for the first time, the disciples accept that Jesus indeed is the Messiah who they and all Israel have been waiting for. But what they didn't understand yet is that Jesus is a suffering Messiah. He is not a political or military Messiah. Their eyes have been opened, but like the blind man, in the first instance, they still can't see clearly. The blind man could only see people like trees walking. Similarly, the disciples' spiritual eyes still have a lot of blurring. It wasn't until Jesus was resurrected from the dead that the disciples understood the full meaning of Jesus as Messiah. Until Jesus rose again from the dead, they did not understand that the kingdom of God is not a physical kingdom like the Roman Empire, but a kingdom where God is king and reigns in the hearts of men. Until Jesus rose from the dead again, they did not understand that Jesus is God who came to earth to die for their sins and our sins too. Until Jesus rose again from the dead, they did not understand that Jesus is the only way to get forgiveness of sin. Forgiveness is not gained by praying at the temple or offering animal sacrifices. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So it was only after Jesus rose from the dead that they received full and clear sight like the blind man. What about us now, 2,000 years later? We have the advantage of looking back in history and seeing that all of the predictions about the Messiah were fulfilled in Jesus. We see proof of his resurrection. We see that the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus promised, did come and dwells in the hearts of all Christians who love him. We see from history how this good news spread supernaturally, starting with some insignificant people like the disciples, oppressed by a brutal pagan Roman Empire. It ended up with Rome as the center of Christianity. And it didn't stop there. It went, this faith in Jesus spread all over the world. And here we are today in Malaysia and in Sydney, worshiping God on this Sunday. So with the hindsight of history, how would you answer Jesus' question? Who do you say I am? If you are listening here and are not sure who Jesus is, I'm glad that you have joined us and that you are searching for the answer. Maybe you are at the stage like the blind man in the first instance, where you see good things about Jesus, and but his real identity is still blurred to you. Maybe you've come to the point of accepting him that he is a great teacher, or that he is a role model of what a good man is like. Or maybe you accept him as a prophet. But you know what? Jesus did not give us that option. See, as Lewis once famously said, that Jesus is either a fake who wants to con people to believe that he is the Son of God, or he is a lunatic who thinks he is the Son of God, or he really is the Son of God, who he said he is. But he cannot be 
a great teacher or a great role model. He did not leave that option to us. We will all have to decide who Jesus really is. And we can't sit on the fence. So if you are not sure, why don't you come directly to Jesus, like the blind man, ask Jesus for a second touch so you can see clearly who Jesus really is. This is the most important decision you will ever make in your life because the consequence lasts for eternity. What about the majority of us listening here today who have already answered that Jesus is the Son of God and have accepted him as our Lord and our Savior? Is that where we stop? Is he just a ticket to get to heaven, but our lives then continue as normal? No, our lives should be radically different because Jesus is our Savior and Lord. I can see three areas where our lives should be affected by Jesus being our Savior and Lord. First is our use of time. If Jesus really is our Savior and Lord, how much time do we spend with him each day? We all live busy lives and often we forget to spend time with God daily. Maybe this time of working from home or studying from home, we don't have to waste time traveling. We can start spending more time in Bible reading and prayer each morning. <clears throat> Use a devotional book to systematically go through the Bible. Think about what the passage means and pray asking God to show you what you want to do, what he wants you to do with the passage that day. Pray also for anything else that you have to do that day. If you don't know what to pray for, how about I find it helpful to make a list. So on Monday, you may like to pray for your work or your school or uni. On Tuesday, you may like to pray for your family, etc. Make a list of what to pray for each day of the week. Start doing this each day with just 15 minutes. If Jesus is our Savior and Lord, surely we can find 15 minutes each day. The second area where which our lives should be affected is our use of money. Money can have a strange hold on even Christians. Remember that God gave us his only son, Jesus, to die for us on the cross. If that is how much God loves us, surely he will give us all material things that we need for life. Therefore, let us accept that all the material things he gives us belongs to him and is sufficient to provide for what we need. As a result of this pandemic, our savings, our provident fund, our investment have had a drop in value. Some may even have lost their jobs or live with insecurity. But let us trust our loving Heavenly Father who gave us even his only son. So Jesus said in Matthew 6 verse 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. We can depend on that promise because Jesus is our Savior and our Lord. Thirdly is our relationship. People can see, can people see that Jesus is our Savior and Lord? by looking at our relationships with our family, our staff, our colleagues, and our friends. 
do they see our love of people because Jesus gave us his love and we show the same love to other people? Our relationships in a family is really being tested during this period of MCO. In Australian newspapers, there are articles saying that during this lockdown, there is an increase in both domestic violence and an increase in love, which will result in a baby boom at the end of this year. How do we treat people who are closest to us? Do we show greater appreciation of our spouses, our parents, our children? As we have been given the greatest love of all, let us also show our love for others. In summary, if we say that Jesus is our Savior and Lord, let it be shown in our behavior. May our Lord's name be glorified in our lives. Let me close by giving this homework for you this week. Jesus asks, who do you say I am? So this coming week, please ask someone else the same question. Listen carefully to their answer and then share what Jesus has done in your life. Amen.